Well, welcome to our service. It's August, and as usual at Christchurch, that means talks done by members under the simple title of Why I Am a Christian. More about that later, but let's start as usual by joining together in words of praise to Almighty God. Sing a new song to the Lord. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his triumph day by day. Worship the Lord in the splendour of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. For great is the Lord and worthy to be praised. Amen. Our first hymn continues our worship. The King of Love, My Shepherd Is, a hymn which reminds us of everything we possess once we belong to God through Jesus Christ. Well, once again, we're very grateful to all the members of our singing group who contributed to that song. A summary of why we're gathered for worship leading into our confession. We've come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. Jesus says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God's assurance of forgiveness to us. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. 
Blessed is the Lord, for, for he, he has, has heard, heard the, the voice of our prayer. prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy, and, and in, in our song will we, we praise our God. God. As forgiven people, we are commissioned to live lives that shine a light for God in the world, and that's reflected in our next hymn, In My Life, Lord, Be Glorified. Well, shortly I'm going to come and speak, but before that we're going to have our Bible readings, and the first of them is a very familiar story that comes from Luke chapter 19, and it's going to be read by our youth minister, Nathan Larkin. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, has he gone to be the guest of a sinner? But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Thank you, Nathan. Our second reading comes from Paul's letter to the Colossians, and it's going to be read by our lay reader, Becky Mills. Colossians 2, 9-15 For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. 
In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Well, there's a saying that you shouldn't ask anyone to do something that you're not prepared to do yourself. That's something I believe, which is why it's surprising in some ways that it's taken me so long to get round to doing one of these sermons called Why I Am a Christian. It was back in January 2007 that I first asked four members of Christchurch to give a talk with this title. And it was a little while later that it became the custom to use our services in August for this. It's been such a popular series that it's continued now for well over a decade, with over 50 people from this church, normally people who've never done a talk in church before, sharing the story of their faith. They're all available on our website, so do have a listen to some of them. When I approach people and ask them to do these talks, they're virtually always a bit terrified. But the result, in virtually every case, is us learning totally new things about the life of people who come along to church with us, and in particular, how their faith in Jesus Christ has made a difference through the ups and downs of their lives. I normally ask people to tell the story of their life, to include lots of photographs, and to then sum up what their Christian faith means to them. With our services being a bit different this year, I've asked the rest of the preaching team, who've all done this talk before, to do why I'm still a Christian, including how their faith relates to our current situation of coronavirus. But since I haven't done one of these talks before, this is simply why I am a Christian. So I was born at home on the 30th of January 1969, not far away from Red Ruth in the parish of Illuggan in Cornwall. For Poldark fans, that's the very same parish in which Demel Khan was born. And my dad was at the time the curate of that parish. I was baptised at Trevenson Church on the 13th of April 1969, and within a year, we'd moved to Wallington in South London, where my dad did the second curacy that clergy used to do in those days. I was there between the age of one and four. I had an elder brother called Martin, and my earliest memory at the age of three and a half was going to Carshorton General Hospital to pick up a little brother called Jonathan. When I was four, we moved again to a village called Shenstone in Staffordshire near Lichfield in the Midlands, where my dad was vicar. Some clergy children don't enjoy the experience, but if I'm honest, I always rather enjoyed the attention that it brought, and in my case, it led to a very positive experience of church. Home life was happy enough. I didn't have a great relationship with my older brother. Looking back, I think uh, that was more my fault than his. We were very different from one another, and we get on very well now. But I enjoyed playing in the large vicarage garden that we had with my younger brother and with virtually all of our games based around me being Robin Hood and him being Little John. I went to the local school and with hindsight I was more than a bit bossy, insisting on all the other children playing similar games with me once again being Robin Hood and the rest of them being my merry men. The occasional girl in my class was even allowed to play Maid Marian and I think there was a bit of competition over that. One of the great things about Facebook has been reconnecting with friends that I haven't seen for 45 years or so. And the first thing they always say is, yeah, you're the one who made us play all those endless Robin Hood games at school. In time, my love of Robin Hood morphed into a more general obsession with history, which rapidly became just about the only thing I was interested in. Once a week, I'd walk down to the little shop in the village and use my pocket money to either buy a Ladybird history book, a packet of soldiers, or historical models, which I'd then spend ages making, gluing, and painting. So that was my life, up to the age of 10. 
Living in a small village where I got lots of attention, constantly playing outdoors, Robin Hood games with my little brother or with friends, and devouring everything that I could get my hands on to do with history. In terms of my Christian faith, I don't think there was ever a time when I didn't believe in God and in Jesus Christ, and when I wanted to belong to him. And that was overwhelmingly because of the reality of the faith that I saw in my parents, and in particular the integrity of that faith. Christianity wasn't something that they just put on for Sundays or just when people from church were around. It was something that ran through the whole of their lives and all of their decision making, and particularly in their influence upon us. All four of my grandparents were also committed Christians, my dad's parents being missionaries for 40 years in India. And all of my many uncles, aunts and my many cousins were Christians as well. So it was a pretty consistent message on that front. Looking back now, I was way too militaristic as a child, with virtually all of my historical interest revolving one way or another around fighting and war. And I somehow didn't see a conflict between that and seeing myself as a follower of Jesus. At that stage, I'm not sure I really thought much about the death and resurrection of Jesus and what those things meant. It was more a case of me believing that Jesus was real and that I wanted to belong to him. Life up to the age of 10, therefore, was pretty idyllic for me and fairly simple, with very few problems for me to worry about. But that all changed in 1979, when we moved down south from the Midlands as my dad became vicar of a church rather similar to Christchurch called Emmanuel in South Croydon. And the change was one that I found pretty difficult moving from a small village where I felt very comfortable to a larger town where I felt much less so. I went on to secondary school, Archbishop Tennyson School in Croydon, and in my early years there was really quite badly bullied. It was a very tough time for me. But I survived, partly through two other obsessions joining my ongoing love of history. At the age of 11, and largely as a result of Ian Botham's exploits in the 1981 Ashes, I began a lifelong love affair with cricket, becoming obsessed with knowing as much about it as possible. The other thing that I got massively into from about the age of 13 onwards was school plays and musicals, which again I absolutely loved. And particularly through the stuff that I did on stage, I grew in confidence, developed a bit of a name for myself, developed some fantastic friendships as well. And school turned from something that I hated to something that I totally loved. And across all of this period, I continued belonging to church and to the various youth groups that it had, combining rather a lot of rather noisy and boisterous behaviour with being quite serious about my faith. Every summer I'd go on Christian camps, which were amazingly idyllic times. And it was on one of those camps at the age of 15 in the summer of 1984 that I felt God calling me particularly strongly to belong to him. Like a lot of Christian teenagers, the big challenge I had was integrating my faith into the rest of my life. And there were inevitable ups and downs and times when I did better than others. But a particularly crucial point was in a year off that I had before I went to university, when during the nine months of 1988, I worked in a church in Lewis in Sussex. It was the first time I belonged to a church without my parents. And it was there that it first occurred to me that I might one day get ordained. I remember laughing out loud at the moment that thought occurred to me. I went on from there to Manchester University where I studied history before eventually becoming a teacher of that subject back at my old school in Croydon. And those seven years of teaching at Tennyson's were brilliant years which I totally loved during much the same things that I enjoyed as a pupil, school plays, cricket and all sorts of things like that. And it was during my time back at Emmanuel Church that I also rejoined during that time that I met and married the fantastic Katie. Two years later, our twins, Rebecca and James, arrived, which was pretty exhausting, but great fun. And it was when they were three that we all moved up to Oxford for three years, where I trained for ordination. At the end of that time, the diocese paired me up with a church called Christchurch in New Malden, and I came along to be curate to Stuart Downey here in 2003. Just two weeks before we arrived in New Malden, our third child, Abigail, was born. Stuart Downey eventually retired as vicar of the church in 2006, and a year later, 
in 2007, I succeeded him as vicar. I'm now in my 13th year as vicar here at Christchurch, and I'm enjoying the challenge and the variety and the significance and the privilege of what is a fantastic and enriching job as much as ever. So that's an outline of my life and some of the key moments in my Christian journey, particularly highlighted. But why am I a Christian? What is it about Christianity? What is it about faith in Jesus Christ that does it for me? Well, the answer, in a nutshell, is the transforming power of God's love. That's why I chose that passage about Zacchaeus that was read to us earlier. It's a famous story, and the story of a man who was despised and hated, who was both damaged and damaging to others, whose life was completely transformed. And it was transformed through the love of God in Jesus Christ. In some ways, what gives that story its power is its lack of detail. Zacchaeus, this hated tax collector in Jericho, climbs up a sycamore tree when he hears that Jesus is coming because he wants to see him. And Jesus, upon seeing Zacchaeus, comes to his home. And that act of love, unthinkable for a rabbi to show to such an obvious sinner at the time, was what transformed Zacchaeus' life. And we see that pattern repeated again and again in the stories of the Gospels. Again and again we see Jesus encountering people, sharing his life with them and transforming their lives with his love. And what I think convinces me of Christianity more than anything else is the examples that I've seen in my life of the love of God bringing similar transformation. The integrity of my parents, for instance, and all the goodness and wisdom in their lives springing from their love for God. The care and kindness that I received from youth leaders at my church and the leaders on those summer camps that I went on, all generated by a similar love for God. Here at Christchurch, seeing the impact upon lives of our lunch club, Grapevine, or the night shelter, or groups like Women's Own and Connections, when people seek to share the love of God with others. The difference that love has made through the many ways in which people have showed it during the lockdown. All of this love is to me undeniably supernatural in its nature, meaning that even the smallest acts of kindness possess this strange and amazing power to punch above their weight as part of the power of love taking on the power of evil and defeating it. Because that's the Christian explanation for what's happening in these situations and it's the one that I find so convincing. What Christianity claims is that the reason that love possesses this strange power is because of the ultimate act of God's love which occurred when Jesus Christ died on the cross. Evil in all of its worst forms, corruption, betrayal, weakness and numerous other things conspired to put Jesus on that cross and that evil was met in his person with the fullness of God's love, a love that refused to return that evil with more evil and through God's supernatural love broke its power. And that's why the resurrection of Jesus then happened. Evil had been defeated and its power had been broken. And because of Jesus' subsequent ascension into heaven and the coming of the Holy Spirit, we can live in that love. We can tap into its power. When we belong to Jesus Christ through baptism and faith, we're both transformed by that love and become further agents of its transformation. The theology of Christianity, in other words, makes sense of everything that I've experienced throughout my lifetime in the church. And it also gives a much better answer to what I think I was searching for in so much of my life, in all of those rather obsessive interests that I spoke about earlier. I think the thing that united them all was a desire on my part to see good triumph over evil and to somehow be part of this movement. But I had to grow up and I had to realise that a lot of the romance and the simplicity that I associated with this picture was false. History, I had to discover, was a lot more complex with all of us being a massive part of the evil in the world. I also had to accept that even a riotous school musical, however inclusive and joyful, wasn't the answer to all of the world's problems. The answer was, and is, the God 
I'd always been taught to follow and who had entered into history in his son Jesus Christ to liberate this world with the power of his love and to make us part of this project. The genuine way to fight evil I had to learn isn't with weapons and war and retaliation, it's with sacrificial love. That's the only antidote. That's the only solution to the evil within this world. That's the reason we had that other reading from Paul's letter to the Colossians, which describes Jesus disarming the principalities and powers by his death and making a public spectacle of them. When Paul writes that passage, he's got in mind those triumphs when Roman generals would arrive back in Rome and would parade through the city with their defeated enemies in a public spectacle before executing them. Now that image is taken by Paul and completely subverted by being used to describe the way in which Jesus Christ made a public spectacle of evil and the demonic powers and triumphed over them through his death on the cross. And earlier in that same passage, it speaks of the share that we have in this, the share that we have in the fullness of God that dwells in Jesus Christ through the baptism and the faith that joins us to his death and resurrection. And that, in a nutshell, is why I'm a Christian. As I look back on my life, now that I'm 51, with all its ups and downs, and all of those various different churches that I've belonged to, and the different stages in my lives, the ones I've found more difficult, and the ones that have been easier, I realise how incredibly fortunate I've been to have had so much Christian influence upon my life. And that's partly why I possess such a strong calling now to pass this on. Supremely to pass on the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection. And the good news that when we become followers of Jesus Christ, when we belong to him, we share in the fullness of God's love. Bringing us acceptance as his forgiven and accepted children. And also a crucial role in his ongoing work of transforming the world with his love. We all make heaps of mistakes. I've made loads during my life and I'll go on making plenty more. But God nevertheless wants me, God wants us, to belong to him and be part of his ongoing work in the world. He wants to use the gifts and characteristics that he's given us so that more and more people are transformed by his love. That's why the church exists. That's why Christchurch New Morden exists. And that's why I am a Christian. We're now going to be led in prayer by Katie Lothman. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you come into our lives, however messy they are. You don't wait for us to be worthy, but you help us to become the person you want us to be when we respond to your love. And Lord, I praise you for this love and acceptance that we have from you. Lord, you have destroyed the powers of evil through Jesus' resurrection. And because of that, we can be made alive too, along with Jesus. We're forgiven and not condemned. We're transformed like Zacchaeus by compassion and a new determination to do what's right and just. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will fill us with strength and love to live that out in our lives, that you will fill us with love from you, that you will fill our hearts with compassion and our actions with kindness, Lord, as we live out our lives as the person you want us to be. We thank you, Lord, for the power of love in people's lives that can transform their situation. We praise you for the power of Jesus' love breaking the power of evil. And we thank you for giving us the power to do that too, as we fight evil with sacrificial love, wherever we find it, in our lives or in other people's lives. And Lord, I praise you that you've given us the means to do that, even though we're also part of the problem of evil in the world. We can use our gifts so that people are transformed by your love. And Lord, please will you show us the gifts that you have given us that we can use to transform situations for other people. 
We pray now about our COVID quarantine situation. We thank you for the strength that we can draw on from you in these times of continued isolation. We think of those who are still completely isolated and missing the people and the connections that normally give them strength. And for people who are still isolated, who have always been isolated, who really need those connections. Lord, help us to reach out by phone or by post or online to shine the light of your love into those people's lives. Thank you that with you we are never truly alone because you put your love in our hearts for us to pass on. Please put into our minds someone who we can reach out to today and transform their situation with your love. Amen. We pray now for those working in the NHS and fighting the pandemic. God of healing and compassion, we thank you for the establishment of the National Health Service 72 years ago. And we praise you for the dedication of all who work in it. Please give skill, sympathy and resilience to all who care for the sick and your wisdom to those engaged in medical research. Strengthen all in their vocation through your spirit, that through their work many will be restored to health and strength. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we pray now for the people in our own church who are not well. And we think especially of Valerie Johnson, Val Perry and Peter Coombs who was a vicar here in the 1960s who's in hospital now at the age of 91. And anyone else you know who needs our prayers now, hold them before God in your heart. Heavenly Father, please bring your blessing and your healing to these people and we pray that they will know your presence with them and feel your love and your strength in their heart. Lord God, we hold them before you now and we ask that they will know your blessings on them. In Jesus' name, Amen. And we draw all our prayers to a close, the spoken ones and the unspoken ones, in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you very much, Katie. Well, perhaps it was because he knew uh, that I was going to be speaking today on why I'm a Christian that John Palmer chose Christ Triumphant for our final hymn. And uh, it's my favourite hymn, and the reason I think it's such a wonderful hymn is because of the confidence with which it proclaims that because of everything that he is and has done, Jesus Christ is already reigning over this earth. And that means that he is the one on whom we can totally rely in every part of our lives. Christ Triumphant, ever reigning, Saviour, Master King.
Well, just a couple of final notices at the close of this service. For those listening on CD, Chapter 9 of Nell Garten, that classic novel by Jesse Chalakoum, uh, follows immediately after this service. And if you don't get this service on CD, you can uh, ask for a recording of this, and uh, you're missing out if you don't. So do contact me for uh, the recordings. You can even get back chapters if you've missed any. Another notice is that I've got a book being published this week, on Thursday to be precise. Uh, earlier I mentioned in the talk my dad, Gordon Kurt, and back in 1987 he wrote a book called Believing in Baptism. Baptism or christening is the subject upon which there's a great deal of disagreement and confusion, with lots of Christians having valuable but very different and sometimes conflicting things to say about it. The original book sought to help people think through the various issues in regard to it, and it made quite a big impact. Quite a while ago, I thought it could do with being revised and reissued, and so over the last decade, I've uh, been working on that. The revised book is now about three times as long, with lots of extra material, including a narrative that starts and ends the book and tries to make uh, the issues a bit more accessible to people. But overall, the book has the same purpose of helping people to understand baptism and its importance for the church and the whole of the Christian, uh, Christian lives a little better. So do get a copy if you'd like to. And finally, a notice concerning uh, our youth minister, Nathan Larkin, and something that we can support him in. Basically, Nathan is going to be raising money for a charity uh, that is aiming to uh, put a stop to human trafficking. Slavery and human trafficking still exist all over the world. Uh, many people do believe wrongly that slavery ended a long time ago. That couldn't be further from the truth. There are more people being enslaved and trafficked today than ever before. An international justice mission are the largest international anti-slavery organisation in the world, and that includes undercover investigators, lawyers, social workers, advocates and volunteers. An international justice mission, its aim is to end slavery uh, through three activities. Uh, seeking to rescue and restore uh, enslaved and trafficked people, bring them to safety, to prosecute slave owners. Uh, they relentlessly, the charity, pursue justice in the court, uh, trying to ensure that traffickers, rapists and other criminals go to jail uh, so that they can't abuse, exploit or enslave others, and also to strengthen justice system providing training, mentoring and support to police, judges and other community leaders. Now Nathan has set himself the challenge of cycling 500 miles by Christmas with the aim of raising money for International Justice Mission. And if you'd like to sponsor Nathan, and he does loads of work for us at church, not just with the young people, but uh, most of the work for these services, doing the visuals and the editing and all that sort of thing, it's all done by Nathan and his wife Anna. Uh, so do consider sponsoring Nathan and uh, getting him to do these 500 miles by Christmas. Okay, so that's the end of the notices. We're going to finish this service now with a final prayer of blessing. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, bless, preserve and keep you. The Lord mercifully grant you the riches of his grace, that you may please him both in body and soul, and living together in faith and love, may receive the blessings of eternal life. Amen. Christchurch, 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 you more than. Oh, yeah.